Hi, my name is Daria Mizentsuva and welcome to Political World Show. In today's show, we'll talk about the following. Does Putin have to die? When Russian citizens and officials will be ready to fight against aggressor? How could the US fasten the war in Ukraine? What could be the major factor for US to use NATO forces? We'll talk about it with our expert. With us today is a journalist, Greg Stabat. So thank you, Greg, that you agreed for this interview. For me, it's a real pleasure because uh, you are like an example for me. You had a lot of interviews with different people like Gorbachev, for example. Yeah. So a long me, time ago. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's a honor for me to yeah, Clinton or some, someone like that. Yeah. So um, let's start from your book. Uh, you wrote with uh, Ilya Ponomaro the book with the title, Does Putin Have to Die? So for now, for me, it's no doubt that Putin should to die, like as uh, much quicker as we could imagine, yeah? And following your analysis, how far to wait to such Evanman? What should happen for that? In other words, how do I think he's going to come to his end? How do I think he's going to... I mean, first of all, I think one of the people I admire for addressing this question so not only bluntly but appropriately is your own president, President Zelensky. You know, recently he was asked in his response, I, I think he was asked, you know, what do you think should happen to Putin? And his response was, I don't care. And I think that's a really great response for all of us to keep in mind because revenge should not be the goal here. Ending the war and transforming Russia into a neighbor that can be a great neighbor for Ukraine and vice versa, that's a much more worthy goal than punishment for Mr. Putin. I'm not saying he should get away without punishment. I'm just saying there's a much bigger goal that I think is important. and. Human nature is such that sometimes when you begin to focus on revenge, you don't look beyond that. And I don't think that's a real valuable place for any of us to be. <clears throat> Excuse me. Of course, it's hard for me to say that as an American, I can't speak for you as Ukrainians. Your circumstances and what you've suffered at his hands are far different. But I do think overall for the world to want to be rid of Putin and build a better world for Ukraine, repairing Ukraine, uh, getting uh, war crimes, uh, the, the perpetrators of war crimes appro appropriately punished. Um, these are all very important things. And I think, frankly, a Russia to democracy, which the subtitle of the book is How Russia Becomes a Democracy After Losing to Ukraine. I think having Russia as a democracy is a far more worthwhile and valuable goal for the world, and I assume for Ukraine, than merely punishing Putin. Because just punishing Putin may just give Russia another Putin, and then we're right back where we are today. And I don't think anyone wants to be there, including, I don't think the Russian people want to be there. So, uh, Greg, uh, could you explain me how you get involved in such a masterpiece as an American? Well, it was an unusual route, that's for sure. Um, I actually, when Russia invaded Ukraine, I took this very personally, and I began to look for ways that I could get involved and help. Uh, when your president, President Zelensky, launched the website for foreigners to join the territorial defense, I immediately went, and, and once I went there, I realized, you know, your military did not need, you know, I'm six, I was 60 years old at the time. Your military didn't need a 60-year-old American who had never served in the military before. That's not what was being looked for on that website. And I began to look at other ways that I could help. And I actually went to Poland and made a couple of trips into Ukraine uh, shortly after the invasion, both to report back to American media, mostly American radio stations, mm -hmm. and also to raise money. And in the course of doing that, I met Ilya Ponomarev. I began to understand what his goals were. And I actually said to him, you know, I think it would be very valuable for the American people and perhaps for you and your goals. And we should talk about what Ilya's doing. 
uh, I, I felt it would be very valuable for him to write a book in English for the Western audience so people could get to know him better and also understand how he envisioned that Russia could become a democracy and why that would be so important for Russians, for Ukrainians, obviously, because there's not going to be uh, a war or there's going to be an end of an invasion if Russia has a transformed government, but also for the rest of the world. And, and uh, that became a very, I think, valuable working partnership between Ilya and I. I helped him get a contract with a publisher here in the U.S. and then helped him edit what he had already written as a 700-page book in Russian, I helped him take what I thought were the most appropriate parts of that book for a Western audience and then add to it since the invasion had happened to make it what, what the book is today. There are a lot of thoughts, for example, that Russian people, they need someone like Putin. So they couldn't live in democracy. What could we do with that? I, I don't know how to answer that. I, I'm, you know, I'm an American. I am of Russian descent, but I, I don't know the Russian people intimately. I'm as frustrated by that question as I think anyone. Uh, but I do believe that ultimately we are all the same inside. We want freedom. We want to control our own destinies. Because look, the day that we're doing this interview there's protests erupting all over China. And would we have predicted that a week ago? Absolutely not. Uh, for a month or two months now, there's been protests all over Iran. Would we have predicted that at the beginning of the summer? Absolutely not. So I, I, I do believe that the Russian people, when they get a flavor of freedom, the kind of freedom that you get to enjoy in Ukraine and that we get to enjoy in the US, I think once A, the pain of living in a dictatorship, and B, the, the promise of freedom. And I think the third part is, which is very important, I think the Russian people need to know that the world will support them in fighting for freedom. I think that there can come what here in the US we would call a tipping point, just as we've seen in China and Iran. I don't know when that tipping point is going to come, but I do believe the things in Russia for the Russian people will get worse and worse and worse. And at some point, it's going to be like a dynamite stick, right? It's going to explode and the people are going to erupt. And frankly, like you, I believe the sooner the better. But I can't tell you when I think that when I can't tell you, I know when that's going to happen. Well, uh, there are some experts um, yeah, uh, who tell, uh, for example, that uh, we need to uh, gather all, all the Russian people in Russia. So we shouldn't allow them to leave the country. So, and that's the point when they uh, start to be uh, crazy about things uh, that are happening in, in their cities and so on and so on. What do you think about such point of view? Well, I think that makes perfect sense. You're referring, of course, to things like the partial the quote unquote partial mobilization. And, you know, we saw, gosh, I don't remember the number, but so many young Russian men leaving the country when the reality is if you're unhappy with what your country is doing enough to leave your home and leave your family and leave your job, maybe it would be better to stay home and organize with all the others who were thinking about leaving to fight against your government, to replace your government so that your government serves you instead of you serving your government. That is that is ultimately the role in the modern world that a government should play. It should be, as in the US and as in Ukraine, a government of, by, and for the people, not the other way around. When you let people leave, the very people that, frankly, can fight the hardest for change have left, and you're letting the dictator remove the very, the very body that he is most afraid of will turn on him. But what, what can stop them? What can stop them from leaving? Yeah. Well, I mean, countries can close their borders or countries can send them back. I mean, I think there's a lot of things. I'm not a lawyer and I'm certainly not an expert at immigration, but I do know that especially in circumstances like this, where you know that an event is draw, driving people out of the country, 
if you are a neighboring country, you can prevent people from leaving. And you can, even if you're not a neighboring country, you can shut down flights or check people at the border and send them back. And, and this is not a, as I learned in helping Ilya write this book in English, this is this is a, the tip of the iceberg, what happened after the announcement of the par partial mobilization. Putin has been encouraging the kind of people that are most likely to protest to leave the country for years and years for exactly the same reason. If they stay, they're powerful, they have loud voices, they often have access to resources like powerful use of the internet and money, and if you force them to stay, they're going to use those as tool against you as a dictator. So what did he do? He encouraged them to leave, and leave they did. So the reality is uh, the rest of the world should prevent Russians from leaving, and Russians themselves should start thinking about how they can go back and be part of the protest, or else there's going to be this terrible state of limbo that, that again, I don't think serves anyone, especially the, the people of Russia themselves. Yeah, but despite the fact um, many Russian people, they stand uh, for a war uh, between Russia and Ukraine. How could Ukrainians live with it? Uh, what do you make of it like, like an American? When I think about the set of circumstances we, the world, are faced with, in particular you and Ukraine, I think if you look at it pragmatically, You have a choice of going forward for forever with a neighbor that you cannot tolerate, that you're unwilling to forgive. And there's and it's understandable that you would, as a people, feel that way. But pragmatically speaking, aren't you better off finding a way to build a bridge with them and have a working relationship? It doesn't have to be a relationship of love and mutual respect but it can still be a relationship that at least is functional. And maybe over time, the Russian people and, the, and a new Russian government can find a way to prove to you, the Ukrainian people, that they have changed and are loyal to you. But if you're unable to forgive them, unfortunately, I think that means you're trapped in a horrible set of circumstances with a very large country that's on your border. And, and that, to me, would never make me happy in my life because because I don't wouldn't like the fact that the future is probably not going to get any better than the present. You uh, don't fight uh, against Russia. You fight against Putin. But if, for example, Russian people, they finance this war because they pay taxes uh, thanks to which uh, the war could be held. In. So... Uh, What is the reason of this point of view? I, I don't have a perfect answer to that. I mean, it, it is true that if you stay in Russia, you're financing the war. But it's also true. I think this is this is the imperfect imperfection of the circumstances. It's true that if you stay and you work, you're paying taxes that finance the war. It's also true that if you leave and you're leaving because you're opposed to the war, you're not staying and fighting against the war. So unfortunately, and I'm not saying this to defend the Russian people, I want the Russian people to get up off their bottoms and fight against their government and fight on behalf of Ukraine. I want that with every cell in my body, but they're not doing it today. As far as you analyze the war in Ukraine, what is your point of view? How long could it last Well, I don't I, I don't have any, you know, if, if, if I had my way, it would be over yesterday or it would be over six months ago uh, or, you know, you know, frankly, I wish it had been over after three days. Only Russia lost instead of the plan of Putin for Ukraine to lose. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I understand. And I think this is an important point. If you bring the conversation to what people in the West understand about the war or many people, yeah. I. I understand that this war did not start on February 22nd or 24th, excuse me, 2022. I understand that. I know what it started in 2014. Most Americans, I won't say most, many Americans do not understand that. They think this war started 
nine months ago, not almost nine years ago. And part of, so? I'm sorry. Why do you think it's uh, so? Why they have such perception? Because I think, at least in the U.S., the understanding that that fighting has been going on since the annexation of Crimea is just not common knowledge. I think many Americans don't even understand the background behind the annexation of Crimea. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, a few weeks ago, I was doing an interview, and the person interviewing me said, do you really think Ukraine can get back all of their land? And do you really think they can get back Crimea too? I said, wait a minute. When Ukraine gets back all of its land, it's not all of its land and Crimea too. All of its land means it gets back Crimea because Crimea is their land. It's not this extra portion that they're fighting for. It is their land. And I think that is a common a misunderstanding for many Americans, that somehow the annexation of Crimea was for a piece of land that was that that the ownership was questionable or 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 Russia had some claim to it. I know Russia had no claim to it, but there are some Americans that still don't understand that. And so I suspect there's still some people in other parts of the West that don't understand that. I have to say, I think. Ukraine, your government, and you as Ukrainians have done a brilliant job of educating people around the world about your culture, your government, your will to fight, your drive for freedom. I, I think that the Ukraine government and people have handled this war brilliantly on the battlefield, but also on the battlefield of social media and media and, and public perception. But I still think there's a long way to go. There's a lot of things that people in the West still don't understand. Yeah, I think uh, many people could learn this history, for example, thanks to lectures in Yale University. You know that uh, in Yale University, Yale University, you could hear these um, lectures. Yeah, it's amazing what I could see yes. on YouTube channel. And it's easy to understand. Yeah. So if we're talking about uh, American uh, perception, of the war in Ukraine. So uh, we know that uh, if we are talking about electorate of the US, uh, around 70% of people, they support military aid to Ukraine, around 50%, they even would like to make it better, um, supply more military stuff uh, to our country. So in the context of elections in 2024, how can such a factor influence uh, the practical part of uh, receiving more warfare in Ukraine? Because many officials, they, uh, um, they ask for more uh, air defense and so on and so on. And uh, in context of these blackouts, we need it more. We need yes. more and more, uh, much more. Well, first of all, I think we saw something very important in our recent midterm elections. You know, I was in Warsaw at the First People's Congress, you know, just leading up to the to the midterm elections in the U.S. The truth is many Americans, many people in the U.S. had already voted, but the election day itself was on the 8th, and I think the Congress ended on the 7th. And many people came up and asked me at the Congress, you know, do you think the Americans are going to stop sending aid to Ukraine? And my answer then was, no, I don't believe that at all. I think there's a very small, very radical, very vocal minority that say they want to withhold money and aid to Ukraine, but I don't think they have, I think they have a louder voice than they have power. And I think our midterm elections confirm that. I think the part of the outcome is that same vocal minority Many of their views, I think, were voted against by the American people. I think the United States is going to continue to support Ukraine. And I think there's a lot of really important reasons for that. First of all, I 100% support that. I know that there is more that Ukraine wants us to do. And I'm not qualified to, to address why we provide some things, not others. I, I'm just, it's not my area of expertise. Um, but I will tell you that I think the reason Americans will, the American government and the American people will continue to support Ukraine 
is one is it goes back to Ronald Reagan. I mean, for many of us, even if we did not support Ronald Reagan as a president, he imprinted on us how important democracy was. And he imprinted on us how important it was to support people in countries that were willing to fight for their freedom. And I, ha in my lifetime, have never seen a country more willing to sacrifice and fight for freedom than your country, than Ukraine. And I think Americans look at that and they see themselves, you know, back in the in the 1700s when they were fighting for their own independence. And I think anyone who's an American who can't see that in the fighting spirit of the Ukrainian people is blind, is just blind to reality around them. So I think that's one of the reasons we support your country. We also support your country because we know what you're doing is right. And we know what Putin and Russia are doing is wrong. And, you know, as a culture, we are big believers in right and wrong. It is clear that you are in the right. It's clear that Mr. Putin is in the wrong. And I think that's why you'll see so many Americans support the idea of regime, regime change in Russia. They may not understand how it could happen. They may not believe that it could happen, but they want it to happen. Again, because one of the things, if you're old enough to remember the presidency of Ronald Reagan, you know that you want people to be free. You want them to enjoy, you want them to enjoy democracy. And we've already been through this as a nation with Russia when it was the USSR. We saw dramatic change there. Now, granted, the outcome has not been a great one, but we saw that change is possible. And I think I can speak for the American people or most people in the United States and say, we know that change is possible and we will support you in winning this war but we'll also support the Russian people in having a democracy only if the Russian people are willing to fight for it for themselves. Yeah, but still what I heard from the experts that uh, there are some um, Americans who support uh, Russia, who support Putin. So uh, why it happens in, in your view? I, you know what? I can't explain it because it makes no sense to me. I, I, I could speculate that there are some, particularly, uh, they tend to be at the extremes of the left and the right. And I yeah. think they may be supporting Putin in the war because what their real agenda is, is to oppose what the American government is doing. So they don't like the president, they don't like President Biden, either yeah. because they're way left of him or right, way right of him, and that no matter what the administration of Joe Biden does, they're going to oppose it. I don't believe they're opposing it for any kind of philosophical, any kind of legitimate philosophical reasons. They're just opposing it because they have an internal political agenda, and they see that that will help them. By the way, I think in the end, it's going to hurt them. I think they're going to pay for it. I think it's going to cost them power. I think it's going to cost them support. And again, not my area of expertise, but for the people of Ukraine, I would say, don't worry about those extremes. They're not the ones that, that make the decisions, and they're not the ones that ultimately determine the support of the United States. The United States has said over and over again that we support the people of Ukraine, and I believe that's going to be our policy until this, this uh, conflict is ended and your country has won it. Yeah, and back in uh, to the elections, uh, we know that some uh, Republican uh, skeptics, uh, they are calling for audits um, and other accountability measures of weapons uh, that uh, receive uh, Ukraine. Uh, yes, so uh, what do you think about these factors? Republicans, we know that they... Uh, uh, have been talking about it a lot of times, so we need to check uh, the budget, the, how this weapon goes to Ukraine, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, does it point, uh, from your point of view, also like speculation, or there are some concerns, uh, real concerns in the U.S.? I don't think there's real concerns. I, I will say, I think accountability is important. I want to know 
that all the money that my government is sending to your country, as well as all the money that that private citizens and businesses are sending to your country, I want to know that it's being used wisely and for the purpose that it was sent. We, we all want that. Do I also understand that, you know, in any culture and in any bureaucracy, there will be some corruption? Of course there will be. It's there has the United States is not corrupt free. So we cannot ask Ukraine to be corrupt free. But I think it's fair for us to ask that Ukraine be accountable and monitor where the money and the hardware is going to make sure it is going to appropriate places. And by the way, I think, you know, we have not only can we ask the Ukrainian government for accountability, but we have a whole other arm called the the, the press is also looking because, you know, if you're a reporter and you can find some significant trace of corruption, this is going to be great for your career, right? I mean, you yeah. understand that. I understand that. We're always looking for a story, right? Well, you know what? In nine months, nobody's found that story. So I believe if the press can't find it and the U.S. government asking for, I'm sure there are conversations about accountability between your government and the governments of Europe and the United States happening all the time. And yet there has not been any significant reason to be concerned about the misuse of funds or hardware, because my guess is there isn't any significant use. Is there some small level of corruption? Probably just because corruption happens when people and power and money are involved. I think 100% corruption free is, is, is too much to ask of any nation. But I think your country is wisely using what they're getting we're seeing the results on the battlefield. And I think that's one of the reasons that countries continue to send more is because we want to send weapons when it's going to make a difference. And it's clearly making a difference. And we want to send weapons when we know they're going to go where they're needed and be used in the way that they're needed, not to fall into the wrong hands. And obviously that's not happening either, I, or I think we would have heard about it. Yeah, and um, also Republicans tell that there should be a third party oversight, uh, yeah? Uh, when uh, the the weapon come uh, comes to Ukraine, and I think it could be the another way of corruption. Uh, don't you think so? So, and also it could be the way uh, of uh, delaying this uh, yes. mission. So, yes. what are you playing for? Maybe they're playing also a hand of Putin. Doing well, this. I, I agree with you. I think that. You know, and I don't think it's I assume that there's people in other countries that are supplying aid. There are people who are playing politics and asking for this kind of accountability or level of, of bureaucracy as well. I think it's largely driven by somebody's own political agenda inside their country. And again, I don't I just don't see it as a majority voice or even an important voice in, in my country. And you know what? Is it is it a politician or even a citizen's right to ask those questions? Absolutely. We have the First Amendment. We believe in free speech. We should not stifle those concerns, but we can really point to the fact that no level of corruption that's worth noting has been seen. And so we should just continue supporting Ukraine in every way we can. And you know what? After the war, there will be an accounting. There, you know, at some point there will be an accounting. And frankly, for Ukraine to have misused funds or hardware in any significant way, that's going to hurt your country so much if it happened that that alone should scare, you know, anybody in any position of power from doing anything. Because if you as an individual have acted inappropriately, it's not going to end well for you. And if the country has acted inappropriately, it's not going to end well for Ukraine. I'm not saying I believe that's happening because I don't. But I just believe there are a lot of checks and balances in the system. They're just not as bureaucratic as some people, I think mostly extreme people, uh, would like to see. Mm, we heard about the possible supply of uh, some equipment, uh, bulletproof uh, webs from China to Russia. Maybe it's not your... Uh, like um, sphere of the com um, competence, yeah. So, but to what conclusions do these uh, developments uh, bring out? There's nothing that could happen in that relationship that would surprise me. 
It doesn't surprise me when the leadership of China seems to discourage China, uh, Russia. It doesn't surprise me when the, then when the leadership of China seems to encourage Russia or possibly supplies things like you mentioned, bulletproof vests. Nothing there will surprise me because I think these are two regimes that are very result oriented. And I don't think they have a lot of ethics. I don't think they have a lot of morality. I think when you're a dictator, all you think about is keeping power no matter what the cost. And I think these are two leaders that will do whatever it takes to make sure they stay in power. So will China provide Russia with things like bulletproof vests? If they think that it's going to help stay in power in China, I think they will. And will they discourage Russia if they think it'll help them stay in power in China and vice versa? I think we've seen that with Mr. Putin as well. He's willing to sacrifice anything to protect his power. Yeah, um, but there is uh, one more point of view why uh, China is interested uh, to help Russia. So we know that uh, China is the best beneficiary of uh, the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine. So yes. what could be Chinese um, interests uh, to help Russia in, from this point of view? I couldn't understand. Well, again, I'm just speculating, but it may be that um, it may be you brought up secrets. It may be some kind of secret deal between between Russia and China that we don't understand yet. It may be financial. Uh, it may be bailing out an important defense company in China. Uh, it, it's hard to say because obviously there's lots more than bulletproof vests that China could supply Russia with. Why bulletproof vests? Or is it merely opening the door? We start by supplying bulletproof vests And then it grows and we supply more and more types of military hardware. You know, is it really just the, there's a term for that, which I'm blanking on, but is it, is it sort of a, in the U.S., we would call it a gateway drug. You know, does it, it sets a precedent. And then once the precedent is sent, set, China can supply more and more things. Again, I'm just speculating, but here's what I do know. If China is selling Russia bulletproof vests, there is a reason. And it satisfies the agenda of the two leaders of those countries, whether we understand it or not. Yeah. And uh, how do you feel about your country right now? Uh, could we expect uh, some uh, uh, some um, developments around, uh, for example, Taiwan in this context, or uh, maybe Uh, some not fruitful talks between China and US uh, and the US uh, because as I know before China and uh, and US uh, had uh, not bad talks uh, right. but oh, uh, it uh, could be changed after such news like helping Russia from China we know that US urged China all the time all the ways they could do it uh, don't uh, be engaged uh, in the war yes. Stand uh, somewhere uh, <laughs> from it. Well, I'm I'm not going to try to second guess my own government. Uh, I think we just have to watch and see what happens. I, I mean, I think you know, often the past is a good indicator of the future. Uh, obviously, I believe we in the United States want to see the people of Iran win their freedom. We want to see the people of China win their freedom, just as we want to see the people of Russia win their freedom. And I think we're going to do, I hope we're going to do, whatever we can to make sure those three countries are successful at that. And I think supporting Ukraine in that is very, very important, just as it is supporting the Iranian people and the Chinese people. Uh, we hear from the news that the U.S. unexpectedly deploys a second brigade of the 101st Airborne Division near the border of Ukraine and Romania. So, and this unit of division was deployed uh, the first time during eight years, as we know, yeah? So, and uh, I'm talking about some tension between Russia and the American-led NATO military alliance. Is it possible? What sign does it give for you such uh, um, actions uh, Of America. Well, I, I, I'm going to give you 
a, a very vague answer. Everything that my country does today in relationship to your part of the world, I see as a sign of support for Ukraine. So I can't explain why that would support Ukraine. I mean, I have ideas about why it would you support Ukraine, but I don't believe we would do anything other than to support Ukraine or to send a message to Russia that we are not going to stand by while they do things that can that increase the threat to Ukraine or increase the threat to other countries around Ukraine, obviously including NATO countries. But if NATO, for example, use uh, if USA use NATO forces on the territory of Ukraine, would it be for you the support of Ukraine or engagement in a conflict? Is it, you know what I I'm I'm not I'm not up on the story enough to have an opinion on that. <laughs> okay, okay, it's good answer. Yeah, I'm I'm not trying to I'm not trying to take a cop out. I'm trying to be honest about you know I, I don't want to I don't want to try to answer something when I see things happening that, for instance, might involve NATO and my country. I assume because my country supports Ukraine that it is either in support of Ukraine or the leadership of my country knows something about Russia and needs to send Russia a message uh, about something it may be planning in another part of Eastern Europe. Yeah. Thank you, Greg, and um, keep in touch. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. It was very nice meeting you. Yeah, bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. And don't forget to be subscribed to our YouTube channel to be in the heart of the most important news about Ukraine and the war in Ukraine. And leave comments because your position, your view, and your thoughts very, 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 very important for us, for Politeca.